Hi everyone. I'm sorry if I didn't get to chat with you a while ago. I was like busy preparing. We end after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'll, yeah, we can chat like after. So thank you, Sophie, for the introduction. And thank you, Elisa, for presenting TBEAT. And thank you all also for being here so early. I hope you enjoyed the breakfast, the coffee. So in this 20 minute presentation, I'll share with you my take on today's topic, um, Native. And I'll also share with you my journey bridging global aspirations with local action to create tangible change and how also this finally helped me to embrace my roots. So first of all, if you could take your phone out, I'm not so sure if you have it on you, if you can uh, scan this code and answer the simple question, where are you from? Okay, great. So, I mean, nice to see how diverse we are of like, origins and um, so yeah for many people it was like very straightforward and for others a little bit more complex and for myself this question has always stumped me i mean i always pause for a few seconds i always wonder like what to answer do i tell them my nationality where do i currently live what do i call home where do i grow up or what i identify as and I'm sure a few of you can identify with this also as an expat or as a third culture kid or um, first generation immigrant or someone with generally a more complicated um, life course. And yeah, so like on my background, I, so my mom's Filipina and my dad's Swiss. They're actually here. <laughs> and so I lived in the Philippines in my early childhood, and then I moved here in Switzerland um, later on. So in some way, I always felt Swiss-ish or Filipino-ish. And early on, I just felt I also had more in common with people from an international background. So this is this might explain why I pursued global studies, and I ended up working for the international organizations in Geneva. And I pretty much identified myself more as a global citizen part of a global community that's reunited by an ambition to contribute to the global, um, to the common good. And working in this field has been like very enriching for me. I've worked with a lot of brilliant people from different backgrounds and we tried to find solutions to some of the world's most complex and pressing issues. Like, for example, um, preventing the spread of life-threatening infectious diseases or leveraging um, information communication technologies for good. So this global ambition can be summarized by this framework. Um, I don't know if some of you know, know of this or have heard of this. So the, these are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, these kind of guide their work. Some companies also adopted, some, and also other organizations adopted. And basically, these are 17 goals that are to be achieved by 2030. So, as you can see, these are like broad aspirations like eliminating hunger or providing access to clean water and sanitation. And however, um, progress in achieving these global goals have stalled and been reversed. And this can be explained, I mean, I'm sure you're following the news. There was the pandemic, there's ongoing economic and political um, instability. There's also major conflicts happening and there's also climate change also in the background. So in this current state of affairs, many people are questioning the efficiency, the effectiveness and fairness of international development policies and practices and whether they really make a difference. So as a result, there's a growing discourse calling for a shift towards community-based approaches. So what do we mean by that? So traditionally, development approaches are top-down, which means um, outside actors such as governments and aid, aid agencies dictate development agendas and, and priorities to their beneficiaries and their ones who implement these projects also, while community-based bottom-up approaches empower locals to take ownership of development interventions. So they set their priorities, uh, decide how to allocate resources, and they implement projects that meet their specific needs. 
And the ideal scenario is to merge both and to connect local knowledge and practices with conventional science and methodologies to solve local to global problems. So, so um, th there are many advantages to, um, to doing so. Sorry. So, so there are many advantages for localized action. Um, it enables these um, interventions to be more um, context appropriate, to be also better informed, and also to actually meet um, the beneficiary's needs. And in the same time, um, we see that local knowledge, I mean, indigenous knowledge can also actually contribute to these global goals by actually, how do you say it, providing new solutions to old problems. So for example, we know that indigenous people, peoples can actually transmit knowledges and practices that can um, preserve nature, protect nature. And so for example, we often call those um, nature-based solutions. Um, also on my personal side, um, yeah, going back on my life, I went through my own personal crisis. So during the pandemic, I felt deeply disconnected with my peers and my own sense of purpose. And this somehow led me to a mild burnout. And later on, um, I broke up with my job and my partner. So at that point, I, co I was compelled to take a break and find myself and explore my needs. So I went through my pretty long phase. <laughs> I know it's a big cliche, but it's a reality. And yeah, I went out for a three month solo backpacking trip around the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And my first destination was a beautiful island called Shargao. So that's in the Philippines. Yeah, just gonna go back here. So in the southeastern part of the Philippines. And it's a known um, surf destination with really beautiful landscapes. And when I was there, I met up with a friend who was from Lausanne and who moved there five years ago to open his small nonprofit. And as we discussed, he shared a lot of like the issues behind the um, idyllic um, scenery. So there's, there are cases of exploitation. Um, there has been also like major natural disasters. Um, there's also issues with waste management and also people lack resources and opportunities on the island. And well, he was intrigued by my background in um, international development. So he asked me if I wanted to join the team. And of course, like working on ground and contributing to tangible change was an amazing opportunity. So of course I accepted. And yeah, so this organization is called Local Lab. So it's a grassroots nonprofit and it has a big ambition to create with and for the community an island that embraces a sustainable lifestyle and its unique identity. So I'm just gonna give you a quick peek on what we do.
as you can see from this video, we really have a holistic set of um, activities. We do sustainable farming. We also uh, promote arts and culture. We also promote the circular economy. We also have projects with youth empowerment, and we have actually way more. So it's a very like global and holistic approach. And yeah, what intrigued me to join the organization was really to work with a team of idealistic creatives and contribute to their innovative approach in uh, community development. So actually that's what the name Local Lab somewhat reflects, the like experimental, but also the, yeah, very community focused side. So we also embrace the idea of Inato. So Inato is a uh, local word that describes a way of doing that is resourceful, practical, and ingenious. So really going from a place of simplicity and like making the best out of it. And so for a year, I had their programs and my main goal during that year was to bring the tools to empower the team and the community in reaching their full potential and also to adopt the best practices in the field. And to make the best out of this role, I really had to channel my own creativity in problem solving. And I also had to trust my colleagues with their creative process. And it was like a really good combination. And one project I'm actually particularly, particularly proud of, which I find like really showcases this is um, the revamp of Locale's artisan project. So this project aims to provide livelihoods and to preserve the craftsmanship of weavers in two villages in Bitaug and Caridad. And we really wanted to value their work with fair prices and also by sharing their craft to the general public. And the initiative to revamp this project was led by a very um, talented Filipino-American intern whose name is Krista, and she was supported by our community team, uh, Michelle and Catherine. And their main goal was to co-create new designs and to improve the marketing of the products. So I'll just show you the process that they took to do this. So first of all, of course, they started with some research. So they con conducted a market analysis. They did some surveys. Um, they also consulted with the community. They held like discussions <coughs> to discuss on like, um, yeah, to learn more on what are their needs and how they, they do things. They also observed the whole production process. And after that, that's when they were able to start creating new designs and to actually pro prototype these designs. Mm -hmm. And also a big thing that we helped them with is to price the products uh, fairly. So unfortunately, like when we did the survey, we learned they were only making a one peso um, profit from their sales. So that was before. And one peso is probably like 0 0.05 um, Swiss cent. So they really aren't making money at the end from it. And finally, we helped them with the sales and marketing of the products. And we created an appealing and bigger catalog. And we found new ways to market and promote very new products to sell it to a more profitable market like um, the tourism industry, uh, tourism in general, and yeah, resorts. And we did a launch at the, the very end of the process where they got to proudly showcase their work, um, meet potential clients. And yeah, there was like a lot of like interest for, for this. We got like a lot of um, people who actually directly brought the these new products, but also new orders from um, a few resorts. So pretty much all our projects have a level of artistry and creativity, but I'll show you some other notable ones. <clears throat> so the Pasado Youth Club um, aims to empower high schoolers to share the narrative about their island and to shape the future of the island with this narrative. 
if you all know Fatula Easy, so we actually launched it there also. Mm-hmm. It's a really fun melting melting pot of like styles and people. So like locals actually get to dance and hang out with the tourists. Um, and we also have our social enterprise called The Hub, and it hosts um, several of several activities. So we have the snack bar, and the snack bar uses local produce that's um, sourced from our partner Smallholder Farms. We also have our market, which where we sell the produce from our partner farms also, and we sell the handicrafts mm-hmm. like the um, carpets that we showed you. And finally, we also sell artwork from artist friends. And we also hold various community events. So the purpose of the hub is really yeah, to be profit generating, but that these profits actually go back to our projects and actually create employment opportunities for, um, for the locals. So despite these promising initiatives, grassroots organizations are actually generally under a lot of stress, especially if they're in a rural or resource-deprived area. So they face many limitations. They usually have funding issues. Also, when you want to carry out like um, projects, it's hard to find skilled, qualified, experienced people who can actually carry out these projects. And finally, um, these organizations are also very vulnerable to the volatile environment. As I told you, um, like two years ago, there was a massive typhoon, but there's also like social and political dynamics, like again, like big industries going to the island and like putting under threat the many, how do you say it? Putting under threat like many, many things. So that's why I'm also taking the occasion to actually promote Local with you. So Local would love to work with people who have the time, the passion, uh, the skills to share um, to share with them. So we have um, you have the possibility to do an artist residency, an academic residency, an internship, or volunteering. And the idea is really to immerse within the community and to, to share your knowledge uh, mutually. So after a year and achieving the extent of change that I could bring to Local, I decided to go back here in Osan. And it's because on one side, I realized what really drives me is to facilitate collaboration and uh, between people, discipli- disciplines, and fields. And I also realized that my mix of origins actually became somewhat of a strength because now I'm actually specifically placed to advocate for these groups who are often missed out in the global scene. So this is why I'm also appreciative for Creative Mornings because it provides us with a platform to connect and to weave together our unique ideas, experiences, and aspirations into a rich tapestry that finds innovation and action for positive change. So here's a bit more about Local. If you wanna learn more about us, you can take a picture. And also uh, if you wanna talk after like I'm around, we can chat. So that's pretty much it. Thank you everyone for your attention and Thanks for the Creative Mornings team for making this possible. And also to our sponsor TV for their generosity in hosting our event. Thank you very much, Patricia. We have 10 minutes for Q&A if anyone has any questions. We're not done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. This was so nice. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel inspired to go to the tomorrow. It's <laughs> <laughs> yes, gorgeous, clearly. Um, I think you touched on that a little bit, but just to go a little deeper, like, um, 
I think a lot of us expats that are here in Switzerland, and I'm going to be very careful on how I phrase this question because I don't want to be sensitive to any nationalities or countries, but in specific my case, I come from Brazil, and you kind of get used very fast to the organization, and it's so clean and, you know, politeness and many things of, like, let's say, Switzerland being such a little country. Did you, even though you were a uh, Filipino and you had that background, mm -hmm. did you have any kind of cultural shock or challenges there that you were like, whoa, this is my Swiss mindset? Like, when it comes to that, did you feel like a true native? Or did you have any uh, bigger hurdles than the association itself? Okay, so yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, there, there was like a big, somewhat culture shock, but it was actually more on, yeah, the professional side, as you said. <laughs> I worked with big organizations that had like very strict processes, all these things. So I arrived there and then you asked people well, like, okay, how do you do things? And like nothing, like everything's kind of done. How do you say it? Very, like again, like that word in a talk, like really <laughs> reflects it well. So you really make the best of what is like available. And like, yeah, you just try to do what you can with like, yeah, in a very simple way. And I mean, for example, I like pe people would like to joke like, oh, you're very Swiss. And actually my job there was actually to be like the Swiss person and actually put the procedures <laughs> and processes, all those things. So, so in some way, yeah, it was like my job again. And that, that's also like the creative side of it. It's like, I really had to, how do you say it? Like I, of course, like contribute my skills, my experience um, to to the team and the community. But in the same time, like I didn't want to impose my way of doing things because like maybe that's not fit for um, for the situation there. So so yeah, so I really had to juggle between okay, like what I perceive is the right thing to do, but in the same time, still like take a step back and how do you see it? Like accept also other ways of doing. So I think that's also like one of the great things I got from there. I feel like I'm a, like much more open-minded in terms of like uh, ways of working and yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I work for a global environmental NGO, so I really appreciate the connection between uh, the work of the private sector and the local actors. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you could explain a bit more about the role in Switzerland. Are you looking for kind of funding? Is it access to markets? Is it environmental expertise? Or is it all of these things? So my experience in uh, Geneva, in, in, in international. So you're still working for them, right? You're still working for the lab or no? No, so basically I'm kind of like a supporter of Local Lab, but actually like I'm back here to like work back in Geneva. So it's, so my role here is more as a sort of liaison for Local Lab, but it's nothing like really official. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's my role with Local Lab now. And yeah, okay, <laughs> was, was that your sure question? Yeah. Is it a essay for funding or expertise or, or that kind of thing? So. Um, sorry, could you repeat? I was just wondering if there's a search for funding or expertise, but clearly there's just a support that you're giving. It's not using the kind of benefit of being in Europe and the access to markets and things for this company. I mean, in some way, yes. But I mean, like, how do you say it? Not in a very formal way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood the question all, but... Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? But we can, like, chat about it, like, later yeah. also, yeah. Actually, based on this question, I was wondering if the volunteer on the internship that you sent for many people to Ireland, based also in Switzerland or in general Europe, or it's you need people just being in the Philippines and South Valley their own friends, or is it something someone who can also provide? So, good question. Um, we kind of have both. So, when you talk about volunteering, I mean, it's primarily on ground. So, 
So for example, you can help them with a farm or you can also just like support, like you can volunteer in many different ways. Like we don't really define it strictly. Like you can just like arrive and be like, hey, I have like this, I have time, I have like skills and then we'll find a role for you. Um, but we also do have like international volunteers. Like we had, I'm not sure if we still have them. We had volunteers for um, um, like looking for grants and applying for grants, for example. And we also have volunteers from Manila who are taking care of the social media. So, so it's a possibility. It, it's like it's not strict. So if you want, if you have an idea to like volunteer, like you can also just like contact us and then be like, hey, I wanna, I don't know, support you through this or that, and like, so yeah. Yeah. We have different nationality volunteers, right? Yeah, yeah, we have volunteers from the states. Or yeah, the so so I mean, like sometimes, like when we talk about like volunteering, it's usually like more short term things, and then we also have internships. But again, like we don't stay strictly in like those definitions. It's really just like if anyone's like interested to support us, then we can find a way. We'll try to find a way where we can like work together. Sure. Um, uh, you were close to the, the founder and setting up the NGO where there's like a highlight to, or a highlight, a barrier, an aha moment of seeking help to set it up, whether it be not just funding, maybe a legal out, you know, resource or partnership, say with a vendor or certain, you know, supply chain, maybe a barrier, an aha moment. So you can repeat the question because um, I didn't miss well, setting up the NGO, NGO or sort of behind mm -hmm. the scenes, was there any sort of huge barrier that you could remember? Setting up the NGO. So I mean, like when I arrived there, like the the NGO was pretty much set up. But maybe in, the, in terms of yeah, actually, there's a really interesting one that we faced last year. So for us to be able to, so a lot of times, how do you get funding? So, I mean, you can do like a lot of, um, you can do like, uh, like people can do like small donations or you have also like private people who can give like <clears throat> bigger funding, for example. And a lot of times they ask like, oh, are you um, certified by um, this like um, certifying body, for example? Um, I don't remember the name of that one, but there's like a national one in the Philippines and we want to be certified by them. However, the process of being certified is very heavy. They say it takes about like four years. There's like so much paperwork. They ask you to do like so many, like you need to comply basically to so many, yeah, paperwork, rules, all those things. And it's also like time, energy, and money, um, uh, yeah, very costly in those terms. So we actually, like, we were asking ourselves, like, okay, if we actually focus on that, we might have to hire new people who will focus uh, on that. I mean, our admin, uh, the, the person taking care of the admin is one person. So she's taking care of, like, all around admin. So for her to go through that process, it's really, yeah, time consuming. And finally, so it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing where it's like, we can't get funding because we, like, it's hard for us to get funding because like, we're like limited by not having that certification, but at the same time, by not getting a certification, then like, we, yeah, it's, yeah, not, not, not having it, like, or we could spend the money, but then like, we have to wait four years for it to really like, go to the end. And it's like some people even say like a lot of other organizations, they go through it and then like it just drags along and yeah. But I'm, I'm not against like um, like the certifying. It's just like we're already certified by one governmental body, but like it's just the specific one because like people ask it because they can get tax reductions mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. of course. And if, yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions? Um, 
sounds like you have a pretty great life change. <laughs> uh, what did you learn about yourself in this process of your like, oh. <laughs> What I learned about myself? Ooh. Oh, uh, maybe I actually didn't like think through it. Um, I'm still processing it. So I just like arrived like three months ago. Yeah. So I'm still kind of processing like being back. And yeah, I think like one of the things I realized was, for example, like one of the questions was like, oh, do I want to stay here or do I want to stay here in the, on the island or do I want to go back to Switzerland? And then like I was like the way that I was saying, like I. I'm really someone who is deeply led by like a sense of purpose and I also realized like like I realized my limitations actually when I was there I realized like yeah working on ground is like so complicated so even like myself as a international development professional like I realized like yeah what were the barriers for these like on ground um, organizations and even myself I was like oh like there's like so much actually in this world that I don't know about and those are like they're like there's so much that I want to learn more now about this field but I can't it's really tough to do it also from there mm -hmm. so so yeah being here being in this environment will also enable me to to do that and also at the end, yeah, I think, yeah, I also realized like I really, like, like I was saying, like facilitating collaboration between like different stakeholders is re is something that like interests me a lot. And that's something I want to pursue here. And again, like it's also about connecting, well, at least that community with uh, the community here also. And yeah, maybe like, enable like positive exchanges with you. Cool. Well thank you very much again, Patricia. Uh -huh. It was amazing.